In this installment of Intern Crash Course, I'll be discussing how to respond to acute respiratory distress that occurs while the patient is already in the hospital, what might trigger what's known as an RRT, or rapid response call. Imagine you are sitting in the team room one relatively quiet afternoon, working on some progress notes, and suddenly you get a page. This is Sam calling regarding patient Smith in room 305. Acute dyspnea started five minutes ago. Respiratory rate is 30. O2 sat is 96% on six liters. Bedside eval requested ASAP. As you close out the chart you're working on and start hurrying over to the patient's ward, you might already be starting to think about what could be going on. The number of potential ex explanations for acute dyspnea is relatively large. For example, this is a diagnostic framework taken from my video on an approach to acute dyspnea. But luckily, you will not need to worry about all of these diagnoses in your current situation because of two limiting conditions. First, the etiology needs to be something that develops very quickly for a patient to be stable one moment and suddenly not stable the next. And second, it will almost certainly be something that a patient is at higher risk from getting due to the fact that they're in the hospital which means either a complication of a treatment that we're giving them or a complication related to acute illness more generally. When I think about acute respiratory distress occurring in the hospital, I put possible etiologies into a few categories. First, is it an alveolar problem? That is, are the alveoli filled with fluid? This could be due to hyperacute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is often colloquially referred to as flash pulmonary edema because it happens so quickly. The four main causes of flash pulmonary edema in the hospital are a tachyarrhythmia, such as rapid AFib, cardiac ischemia, including acute coronary syndrome, as a manifestation of hypertensive emergency, which itself has its own differential diagnosis, and something called TACO, which stands for transfusion-associated circulatory overload. TACO most typically occurs when a patient with pre-existing heart failure including clinically relevant diastolic dysfunction, receives a blood transfusion. Alveolar problems also include aspiration. When the onset of symptoms is extremely quick, it suggests aspiration pneumonitis rather than aspiration pneumonia, as the latter needs hours to days to develop. Now, placing aspiration pneumonitis under alveolar problems may be a little misleading here because the initial problem immediately after aspiration is usually bronchospasm with actual alveolar inflammation requiring a little bit more time to develop. And in this category is TROLI, which stands for transfusion-related acute lung injury, which is an immune-mediated reaction to a blood transfusion resulting in pulmonary capillary leak. So while TALCO is a form of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, TROLI is a form of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But they otherwise can be difficult to differentiate as they both present either during or in the several hours after a transfusion. The next major category of etiologies are airway problems. Here we have anaphylaxis, angioedema, which is swelling of the mucous membranes of the oral cavity and or larynx, something called a mucus plug, which is what it sounds like, a glob of mucus large enough and thick enough to obstruct a major airway, which results in a lack of ventilation distal to it and can result in partial lung collapse as well. And in intubated patients, dislodgement, or other problem with the endotracheal tube. The remaining etiologies include a pulmonary embolism, a pneumothorax, which when occurring in the hospital is almost always within 24 hours of an intrathoracic procedure um, or on someone who's on mechanical ventilation and excessive positive pressure, and cardiac tamponade, which may be post-procedural or from a free wall rupture following an MI. At one time, such post-infarct wall ruptures were a common mechanism of death in patients who had experienced an MI, but this has become relatively rare in the 21st century with improved management of infarcts. So that's it for the already hospitalized patient who develops acute respiratory distress. Almost all of them will have a diagnosis from this list. While it's not super short, it's certainly more manageable than the giant framework I showed before. In my experience as an adult hospitalist in the United States, among patients who had RRTs called for respiratory distress, the most common etiologies have been tachyarrhythmias, aspiration, and mucus plugs. So now as you're running over to the patient's room, 
you are thinking through all those diagnoses in your head, and you come into the room and find the nurse uh, and Mr. Smith, uh, now with a face mask of some kind on, suggesting that they may have even worsened a bit since you were paged. How should you go about assessing the patient at the bedside in a quick and efficient manner? For a patient in distress or one in a hyperacute situation, you need to be very focused with your history and exam. If this is your patient, you will already know the key parts of the history, but if you are responding to a call for someone else's primary patient, the bedside nurse may be able uh, and better equipped to answer these than the patient themselves. Does the patient have cardiovascular risk factors, which increases the risk of any of the causes of so-called flash pulmonary edema? Does the patient have aspiration risk factors, such as being post-stroke, on sedating medication, have a history of, uh, having a history of dementia, or have they been experiencing delirium while in the hospital? Those would obviously suggest aspiration as a potential cause. Have they had any intrathoracic procedures in the last 24 hours? For example, a thoracentesis, central line, or pacemaker insertion all suggest the possibility of a pneumothorax, while pericardiocentesis or pacemaker lead extraction can cause tamponade. A recently started medication suggests the possibility of either anaphylaxis or angioedema. Anaphylaxis typically occurs within six hours of exposure, while angioedema can take days or even longer to develop. And a transfusion within the last six hours suggests taco and trolley. Key exam findings include hypotension, which suggests a PE, MI, pneumothorax if large, tamponade, and anaphylaxis. Bilateral crackles are consistent with any cause of flash or cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as well as a later sign of aspiration. On the other hand, bilateral wheezing is actually too nonspecific to be diagnostically helpful, as it could be seen in most etiologies under consideration. It is not specific for asthma or COPD, particularly when it develops in a patient who is already in the hospital. Asymmetric lung findings can be observed in aspiration, pneumothorax, a mucus plug, or endotracheal tube dislodgement, and signs of a DVT such as an asymmetric red or swollen leg or calf tenderness suggest a PE. At this point, you should move on to other diagnostics. POCUS, which stands for point-of-care ultrasound, can be very helpful to evaluate a patient in respiratory distress, but only if performed quickly and by someone experienced. I've seen more than one RRT call get totally derailed by someone floundering with the ultrasound machine for far too long while the patient's management was otherwise paused. In short, if you know what you're doing with an ultrasound probe, great, you should absolutely use it. If you don't, this is not really a good opportunity to learn. There are different approaches and protocols used to assess the heart and lungs in patients with acute dyspnea. As just one example, there is something called the RADIUS exam, which stands for Rapid Assessment of Dyspnea with Ultrasound. I'm not going to go through the protocol in detail, but this chart lists the major components, their associated sonographic views, and what findings can be identified from those views. For example, the cardiac views might identify newly decreased contractility, suggesting of ischemia or infarction while a lack of lung sliding suggests, but is not diagnostic by itself, of a pneumothorax. Regarding how one should prioritize diagnostics in acute respiratory distress, one must consider both how likely the result will help, how quickly the diagnostic can be done, and how quickly the result will come back. With those considerations in mind, after a focused exam, POCUS is the best diagnostic to start with if there is someone experienced present, as I mentioned a minute ago, then comes chest X-ray, and then ECG, though the order would be switched for someone with either significant tachycardia or concurrent chest pain. Then a blood gas. In almost all cases, a venous gas is sufficient, as the pulse ox will give you a pretty good idea of oxygenation status. Calculating a precise AA gradient from an arterial gas is not really something to spend time on during an acute situation. Finally are all the other labs, including the CBC, metabolic panel, troponin and lactate. The reason these labs are relatively de uh, deprioritized are twofold. One is they'll take the longest for a result to be available, and two, they're actually minimally helpful with the diagnoses under consideration. You know, just look at the list again. How do any blood tests 
other than the troponin help to diagnose anything here? But even then, it will take an hour for the troponin to rise. You know, you still want to draw one as soon as you can for use as a baseline to compare a later troponin to. But if you have a limited number of hands at the bedside, it's not as time critical as everything else listed. While you're still gathering data, it may be necessary to start empiric treatments. First, make sure the patient is sitting upright. This improves cardiogenic pulmonary edema and limits any additional aspiration. Give them oxygen. You should target an O2 sat greater than 90 to 92%. There is little physiologic benefit to boosting it to higher than 92. If the patient is wheezing, despite wheezing being a nonspecific finding, many patients will still benefit from a nebulized bronchodilator. Keep in mind that albuterol may drive up the heart rate in the event that the patient is already particularly tachycardic or that in the event that you're concerned about demand ischemia. If there are signs of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, consider nitrates, if the patient's blood pressure will tolerate it. Sublingual nitroglycerin may transiently improve hemodynamics even in the absence of ischemia. And consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP. This is most helpful in situations that can be rapidly reversed, such as cardiogenic pulmonary edema. I'll end with some common pitfalls in responding to acute respiratory distress in the hospital. Neglecting the respiratory therapist. Whether there are just three, uh, two people or 20 people at the bedside during an episode of respiratory distress, the RT is almost always the team member with the greatest experience in this situation. If the patient is in respiratory distress, and no one has called the RT yet, make sure someone does, even before you have any idea what's going on, the RT will probably be able to help. And once they're there, don't be shy about asking their opinion if you get stuck. Next, neglecting airway issues and the importance of suctioning. There is something about training in internal medicine that seems to bias us into focusing heavily on pulmonary edema and PEs while forgetting to do things like suctioning out aspirated food and mucus plugs. Next, don't jump to diuretics in a euvolemic patient with pulmonary edema. Even in a patient with flash pulmonary edema, secondary to a tachyarrhythmia, the problem is not that there's too much fluid in the body, but rather the fluid that's there is in the wrong place. Plus, diuretics take a while to work. In most cases of pulmonary edema, there are more rapidly acting medications that are more appropriate. Don't forget the option of non-invasive positive pressure, but also don't rely on it when it's contraindicated, such as when the patient is difficult to arouse, is vomiting, or agitated, or when the suspected diagnosis is not something expected to turn around within hours. And last, be careful not to be falsely reassured by either a normal O2 sat or unremarkable chest X-ray. All of the conditions mentioned in this video can become symptomatic before hypoxemia starts, and the radiographic findings of most can lag behind the rest of the clinical picture by hours. That's it for this brief overview of responding to acute respiratory distress in the hospital. Be sure to check out the rest of the intern crash course series for a variety of topics related to inpatient medicine.